Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are finishing up almost our 30th season, you know that I inter interview writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished, what they're planning for the future. It's a bit wider net than just writers, however. We have had on sculptors, we've had on musicians, we've had on actors. So if you have an idea for a guest who might be good for the writer's block, a writer or other brand of artist, watch for our address at the end of the program. We'd be very happy to get your suggestions. I also want to remind you that the writer's block and all the other original programming that comes out of Studio 1623 is a result of cable access television. You don't get this valuable social regional service by subscribing to DISH or trying to get any other way to siphon television into your house. You stick with cable and stick with the writer's block. Thank you. Now tonight, I'm very happy to say we do have a writer, a return guest by the name of Madeline Cavanis, who is a professor emerita from Tufts University, where she held the Mary Richardson chair. She's also, I love to say this, she's also an associate on the Faculty des, des Lettres Université Laval in Quebec. Among her other many books are The Early Stained Glass of Canterbury Cathedral, Medieval Art in the West and Its Audience, Reframing Medieval, medieval Art, Difference, Margins, Boundaries, and a book that she discussed on an earlier show of the Writer's Block, the Early Stained Glass of Canterbury Cathedral. We'll be discussing chiefly her most recent book, and I'm going to ask her to pronounce it, Women and Jews in the... Sachsenspiegel. Sachsenspiegel Picture Books. <laughs> Madeline Cavins, welcome to the Writer's Block again. Thank you, John. Delighted thank, to be back. Thank you for coming, coming down on this very cold afternoon. Tell us about the provenance, uh, your ideas originally for creating this book with your colleague Charles Nelson, and when that began. Many years ago. Uh, all my books take 10 years, but this unusually took much longer. You know, Genesis is hard to say, but at some point when we were team teaching courses in medieval art and women at Tufts, uh, Charlie was teaching literature, that's his field, and I was teaching pictures, my field, and we looked for manuscripts that we could discuss together. And he said, you know, this law book, the German law book, is pretty interesting. It's the earliest long prose text in the German language, so it's treasured by German scholars. And uh, I said, well, law might be a good departure from Christian art, so let's have a go at that. I loved the manuscripts immediately because and I, perhaps we would have one picture to put up anyway to one of them to look at, chapter one would be fine. Uh, there were four manuscripts that copy some lost original, probably one that had something to do with the author of the text. But the four we have are very, very fully illustrated. They're like comic books. Every single page is a little bit less than half text and the rest of it filled with rows and rows of figures enacting the law. So it's pretty interesting stuff. So it's very contemporary, a visual novel. I, uh... Yes, it's wonderful. And made for a 14th century audience who were scarcely literate yet. The professional lawyers were just coming into being. Instead of being a hereditary office to be a juror, you could be elected. and. Uh, they use these books, I think, to learn the law, and they have a very interesting system of using the capital letter that begins one of the clauses in the law to point you in the picture. So the capital letter is in the picture, the same color. You look for a red A, a red A, and so on, and you can probably understand the so law. So some of the same manuscript techniques used in, uh, well, that in, one, in religious uh, Yeah, but that one copying. is very rare. It's only in one other vernacular manuscript. In religious manuscripts, I think they were for a more literate populace, so they didn't bother with that kind of indexing or keying. 
uh, uh, into the text. It's, it's unusual. Um, I also love them because at least a couple of them are extremely amateurish. So they've been bypassed by the real art historians who like high quality court manuscript. And so, you know, I'm the first art historian to write about them in any depth in English. So this is essentially a law book. Yes. Uh, not intended to be a, an artifact, art, artifact at all, a, a, a law book no, for training. They're working books. They were probably used adjacent to the courtroom for the jurors to consult. That's what we think about them. They're sort of ripped to pieces. None of them are complete. Um, the only one that's in pretty good condition, as far as the vellum goes, was never finished. And I think the Duke who had commissioned it must have got fed up with, in fact, in that case, a monk who was drawing the pictures and told him to, for goodness sake, stop, you're making too many mistakes. So that one was never used uh, very much. So is that the only vellum uh, copy? No, they're Others all are vellum. parchment, oh, they're all vellum. vellum. Yes, and, and nonetheless have been ripped apart, corners torn, dirty. So well used. Well used, yes. How long were they used? Well, Sachsenspiegel, the Saxon mirror is the translation, mirror for all Saxon men, the author said, um, remained in use as law until the late 15th century and was revived and used, rather interestingly, by a few scholars in the 18th century. And then it had a very unfortunate modern history, which we also looked into in depth. Uh, it was used by the Nazi lawyers to give them some hints what to write into the new Nazi law. And uh, they had to look pretty hard for bad things, but they found some special laws to deal with Jewish people apart from Christians. So that was one of the things that triggered their interest. And so actually, so they, they could say this is part of our heritage? Exactly. That was the most important thing. This is German. This is not Mediterranean, this is not classical, we're not doing Roman things anymore, this yeah. is German. And uh, a, a miniature version of one of the manuscripts was, this little tiny facsimile was circulated in all the German schools. <laughs> so they loved uh, their medieval German along with it. Well, the, the attitudes towards uh, women, the misogyny, and the anti-Semitism, which is unfortunately so yeah. alive still, was vibrant at the time. Yes, but it was more interesting than that. These surviving copies are made spread over time through the 14th century, 1300, 1350, 1365. And the crucial thing that happened for Jews in that century was the Black Death. And at that point, either the religious leaders and or the population turned against the Jews and killed them. They blamed them for the Black Death. Um, they burned down synagogues. They rebuilt synagogues as churches. But leading up to that, Jews had been actually prospering in Germany, more than in France and in England. So they'd gone there to have a safe haven, as they had for a while to Spain. Uh, they were crucial to the economy not only lending money, which of course they were in a way forced to do, but they were extremely good at dealing with money. Um, they were the horse traders. They were in every market, you know, trading. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the emperor had realized how valuable they were economically, and he gave them special protection as merchants from, from the fourth century on. And then, again, that's one of the things which was their downfall, because they were known as the Emperor's people. Ah. And there was hard feeling because they were supposedly have special protection. And in fact, in the 14th century, they no longer had that protection because they couldn't decide which, which of two or three people to elect as an emperor. So there was no real ruling power to ensure that Jews were safe. Does this legal book, in, re in regard to Jews, reflect the old protective law, or is it a instrumental in introducing restrictive law that departs from that? It's a little of both, but on the most, for the most part, it's protective. And if we could see the opening of probably chapter four, um, 
the one with actually with this image from the cover, which shows the people who were placed under special protection of the emperor, and they included ecclesiastics, of course, monks and um, priests, women, married and unmarried women, and Jews. And in that lineup, the Jews are always lost, they always look marginalized, but they are still distinctly there in, under the law, uh, which meant that, you know, something called the King's Peace, just in English law, uh, if you break the king's peace by attacking somebody in the king's highway, it's automatically an offense. So attacking any of these people, or mills, or farms, or committing violence in public on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, those are all peace days. So the Jews were still in there, theoretically. So you look at the law book, and you look at the law, of course, but you look at the images in, uh, and, and yeah. deconstruct yes. what their concepts were, exactly. even if they might have been unconscious. Exactly. And one of the things that happened as they lead up toward the Black Death, uh, you can see a, a rising anti Jewism growing, and certainly very strong after. And one of the things that they did, if it works again to hold this up, but in a crucifixion here, there's a figure mocking it and pointing at Christ with a Jewish hat. And that's a new thing put into this copy, the latest of the copies. It was not in the previous depictions of that crucifixion. And no. the other damage that was done to Jews actually in the 13th century was a Lateran Council of 1215, which declared definitively that, that uh, the consecrated bread turned into the body of Christ and the wine into the blood of Christ, as transubstantiation. And after that, in re recurrent patterns, there were accusations that Jews had gone into the church and desecrated, as if they were re-crucifying Christ. They desecrated the body and the blood of Christ. And in numerous um, towns in Germany, they were attacked in the street for uh, that. We have slides, and I think a couple of them have been up already that correspond to the first six chapters. Yes. I wonder if you could kind of summarize yes. each of the chapters. Happy and, to. And we mm -hmm. could go through the slides with our director, uh, Becky Tover, could go through the slides. I'm happy to. And because I'm a visual person, I'm actually going to also flip to the pages myself. So if we start with chapter one, I picked the manuscript here that was dated 1336, and it shows the author at the top a man called Eike von Rapgau, who had no particular credentials for writing a law book. We know very little about him, but he set himself up to be uh, the authority, and one of the ways he, the pictures help him do that is that he has his book protected by the Holy Spirit, the dove, for, uh, inspiring him to write it, I suppose. And then above him is the, the shield that the particular patron of this book would have had, so he also is showing a, a kind of patronage that protects Ica. And then below, the way he justifies in this preface that one has to have law for people, he says, well, it was really because the law was given to the emperor and God has the power of salvation or hell, and then <coughs> told Adam you know, not to disobey him, and Adam disobeyed, and because Adam disobeyed, we now need, need a written law for people. And the other very interesting phrase on that page is that God himself is law, God is selber recht. It's a very interesting claim of the authority of, of law, and it merges God's law and man-made law. So that's the beginning of Sachsenspiegel. That's, that's how, chapter one. That's chapter Reading. one of... My reading. book, and I say readings, access people, picture books, that this chapter just tries to deal with a general way of what are these manuscripts, what are they doing, or what kind of, we say, ideological work, that is, who could they have influenced, and they're all questions that come up in detail in the book. And I printed on that page, each chapter opens with an English translation of the Middle German and the original Middle, Middle German, for those who are interested in that. And, and, it, mm. yes. 
I, wa I wanted to go to uh, the should. next chapter because I just glanced at the clock and I went. Yes, well, we'll go the, fast. So the, 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 this is brilliant color, by the way, yes. in, in the book. It's really yes. extremely well done. The, the, uh, the, 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 the prints print. are uh, flawless. Yes, and they had to be gathered from all the sources and you know, get the, the best we could. So then the question is, where were these books used? Who used them? Who sort of tore them apart? And one of a later book has this preface showing that it was the king who gave the law to the people instead of having it handwritten even by a mm. man, you know, so again, <clears throat> magical law. Um, then a chapter, because if you're looking at, at women, of course, we realize we also have to look at masculinity. So you can't just take one gender in isolation in any society. And the norm, of course, was the Saxon man, from the, this book was supposedly written. And I thought that the system of Bergelt, or restitution, if you like, um, damages for a death, the amount that would be paid by one family to another if somebody had been killed or maimed. And it starts with a lot of gold if you're in the higher echelons, but always half for the woman. So on that page, you have a very small woman who's getting, she's only worth half what a man is worth in terms of their guilt. So that's interesting. So the, the, the women are physically reduced. <laughs> yes, and you, you, that's, it's that's, so clear. That's, that's quite <laughs> so clear. clear. Right. You can't miss that. <laughs> And then that Bergelt system goes on all the way down through the social echelons. The illegitimate child of a priest getting that's only a cartload of hay. Uh, a traveling minstrel's life was worth nothing, apparently, or it was worth his shadow. And he's shown next to his shadow. Now. Art always gets short shrift. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so what did women manage to keep? What belongings did they have? They didn't have land very often. That was a rare occurrence. But there were certain things that belonged to their treasure trove, if you like, passed from mother to daughter, passed in the female line. And they included the, the home flocks and herds, uh, pigs and swine and goats and geese and all these flattering things to associate with women. With. The men had magnificent horses. And interestingly, though, well, the mirror, a ring, and books, the household books belonged to the women and passed in the women's line. And we in fact know that women were slightly more likely to be using prayer books anyway than the men. So there was a great deal of literacy at the time? Yes, passive literacy. If you have a prayer book and you can mumble through it, you're not necessarily understanding Latin. And the men who taught, who learned to read Sachsenspiegel, it's a different issue. They were learning how to read German. Oh, uh, this title is in chapter four, Women and Wens oh, yes. in the Mirror, Protection and Control. And control. The, the Wens were a Slavic minority who gradually were absorbed into the German Empire as the empire expanded east. So they were basically from beyond the Elbe. Uh, we think Slavic speaking. They were allowed to keep their language in the courts and they were allowed to keep their marriage customs which included a woman being able to abandon her husband, take the children with her, and remarry. Really? <laughs> yes. Quite advanced. And, which the Saxon women couldn't do. <laughs> so there were cultural rifts that are very, uh, very, um, Quite much distinctive. like our own. Much like our own. And it was worth it to the Saxons to keep the Wends happy because they were terrific farmers. <laughs> and they were backbone of the economy. Um, so then we get to the chapter five about Jews in the twilight zone, the vulnerability of the emperor's people. That is the, the concept that if you're given special protection, but actually it's not there, you're very vulnerable. And they, they were not allowed to carry arms because they had protection of the emperor. But if there was no protection, they were unprotected. And that that sounds, sounds in, in, in contemporary vernacular, that sure sounds like a setup. Yes, yes, and, and then you combine that with the church's new regulation that they should wear a mark of a difference in their clothing so they could be recognized in the street. And that was really dangerous, really, really dangerous. So but, nothing had changed from the, uh, 
the 14th century to the uh, mid 20th century. Uh, and what I love about this culture is so many things um, are really unchanging. I want to throw in just one in. Uh, Jews were not always put upon and are uh, disinherited. This is a very famous Jewish poet who's represented in a collection of poems, the Manasseh Codex, because of the quality of this verse written, of course, in German. And he's treated just like any other court Jew, I suppose you could say, extremely well dressed. So Jews had a real place in middle class society before the Black Death. And then the last chapter deals with what we call reception history, which is reflections of the Sachsenspiegel picture books from 1685 to 2010. And a part of that is concerned with the image there, an engraving, a very beautifully made engraving from the early 18th century, when complete copies of these manuscripts were made by hand with the idea of doing a facsimile. But I had to go back to 1685 because a chance discovery is that a text in this book that says all slavery and bondage are theft of a human life and against God's will is borrowed in 1688 in Germantown by a German lawyer who had just immigrated, Francis Pastorius. And I've looked at his career, and others have too, he's very famous, but he studied at all the great law schools in Germany. He knew this text, there's no doubt about it. Barely anybody in between had dared to say that you couldn't have slaves. In fact, that idea had spread a bit in the 14th century, and there were people burned for heresy for saying that when Adam and Eve were created, there was no master and no servant, and therefore we were equal and so on. And they were burned for that? Yes, there was a preacher in for, England who was for burned point. for that. Yeah. I noticed your date here, your cutoff date is 2010, so yes. that, is that when you had to have a copy of the manuscript into the uh, Not exactly, publisher? no, that was when a, a, a huge active phase of publishing on those books seemed to have been coming to a close. You know, you can always go on, there is more. In fact, a book came out, oh, mine should have been first, but it was delayed, and then a, a German book came out, beautifully illustrated. I walked into a, a book um, fair at a meeting in uh, Berlin, there it was, so I had to put in my footnotes and take account uh, of it. Uh, I have one question about the title that occurred to me. Uh, did you have to invent the term picture book for this yeah. particular book in your research, or is that a translation of a common term in German? No, everybody's worried what to call them yes. because the pictures are so strong in relation to text. There are other things which are more truly picture books. Bible picture books usually have a little synopsis of a biblical chapter and a big picture. But, you know, we worried and worried, how do, how do you do that in a succinct way that is clear to everybody and it seems to be accepted as an extension of that <clears throat> sort of concept? I, I, it seemed to me uh, a difficult project to name this because it's not... Uh, <laughs> It, it's not a, a given. There's no term automatic. We have, no. of course, it's not narration. We, we graphic novel is very common now, right. uh, but this is not uh, narration, and mm -hmm. although it's certainly graphic. No, and this but, is a full page spread of one of the manuscripts, which gives the idea of, the, of an opening okay, like this, yeah. where hold that up for a while to see if Becky can get that. You have to do a little switching around because when you have these pages facing each other in the gathering, <clears throat> again, the pictures are so this, strong These are magnificent so pictures. The, the quality is quite striking. You don't see that very often. Yeah. And it's highly yeah. uh, glossy, uh, glossy pages. It's almost the size of the biggest manuscript. A little disappointed they didn't go to the full step so to these make are it very, another very, few centimeters. The, the, the big the, these are very precise, uh, finely painted, uh, with small, small brushes. Yes. But, but big, you know, this is a hefty size for... But the detail you know, is really, uh, really amazing. Yeah. And this hair, is, um, hair styles and they, different hands. And, and hand hats positions. And they were very interested in getting the right gestures. So, yeah, that's a little of the 
variety. The later one is in a different, more courtly style, a little more formal. Um, they vary. Each one is very distinctive, but based on the same original. Given the idea of deconstructing these images, uh, what are your most fundamental lessons about the status of Jews, the treatment of Jews in the 14th century uh, and, and women at the, at the same time? And women at the same time. I think what, if you put those together, what affected their <coughs> demise was economic problems. I mean, it's I'm all sorry? from economic problems, pressure. Um, there was a famine in, in uh, the, let me think, 1313. It, it's very little known, but it had a tremendous impact on populations. The people in the country managed to eat, but in the towns they died. And uh, there was pressure then economically, but also for real estate in the towns. Mm. And the reason to chase Jews out was partly that, you know, Cologne, they wanted to expand the marketplace. So what could be better than pick on the Jews at the Black Death, burn down their synagogue and move them out? Uh, women, I think, are, are always the scapegoat in troubled times. And this is the century where they began to treat women who practiced herbal medicine as very dubious and possibly witches. And Sachsenspiegel actually says, a woman who mixes potions will be burned. That's a... So, <laughs> uh, we're, we're getting very close to the end of the half hour. I wish we weren't. Uh, and the, the, uh, see, the witches, and this is 300 years before our, oh, yeah. our period of, of witchcraft. Uh, this is fascinating. I very, very much want to thank you, Madeline Kavanis, for bringing in your latest book, Women and Jews in the Sachsenspiegel Picture Books. Well done. It's fascinating work and because it echoes and kind of reflects so many contemporary issues as yeah. well. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you for coming down. I'm thrilled to do it. Thank I'd like you. to thank you in TV land for being with us as well tonight. If you've learned something about medieval lore and the beauty of this book, this picture book from 14th century Germany, then the writer's block has done its job. Thanks for being with us, and I hope to see you again next week on the writer's block. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.